So we'll get started. Um, I am pleased to introduce our colloquium speaker today, Alex Gonzalez. Um, Alex is an assistant professor at Iowa State University. Um, he's done a lot of really interesting work, um, including some work on the interactions between equatorial waves, the IPCC, and the MJO. Um, he's done a lot of work on the diurnal and weekly variability of the ITCZ, which represents some um, today. Um, I've actually known Alex for a really long time. We overlapped at Colorado State University, um, where he did his PhD in 2015 with Wayne Schubert. Um, after that, he did a postdoc at the UCLA Joint Institute for Regional Earth System Science and Engineering, um, where he worked with uh, Jinan Jang and Dwayne Walliser um, on a lot of interesting work um, on equatorial waves and the summer MJO and also looking at um, MJO model biases. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll let you go. Thanks, Steph. So today I'm going to not talk about the MJO, I'm gonna talk about the ITCZ. I'm kind of unsure whether I'm gonna stand on this side or on that side. So let me start off on this side. And yeah, I think I'll start off on this side. But I'll probably move from side to side. Hopefully that's not annoying. Um, so this image is what I would consider amazing, and I love it. This is an amazing east-west ITCZ that's at essentially the same latitude. And it's, I don't know, it's just so pleasing to me. Like, why does this happen? How does this so consistent? But then again, this is, this is November, so um, and the equator is, Galapagos here, so the equator is somewhere down here. So ATCZ is displaced pretty far north, or is displaced north of the equator still in, during this time of the year. But it's a trend, starting to get to the transition season. So why isn't the ITCZ much closer to the equator? Um, over the East Pacific, it tends to sort of avoid that over the ocean. And so that makes ITCZ variability pretty hard to understand um, if you come at, it, come at it from just this sort of naive approach in that you have surface convergence, or low-level convergence, where the trade winds converge, this is where you get this ITCZ, um, and you have often deep convection, but you can also have you know, shallower convection, and even though this is really well organized in an east-west line, there's obviously you know, there's different little mesoscale systems within this sort of large scale, and uh, the Hadley circulation is providing subsidence on either side of this, mainly this side, the winter side, and it's very consistent, um, and that sort of scale is almost planetary. So in many ways, the ITCZ is this multi-scale phenomenon because it involves mesoscale, large-scale, planetary scale, um, and has implications for um, energy transport and climate models, and so, like I said, the ITCZ um, is unique in that it so first of all, it does sort of follow seasonally if you, uh, if you take the zonal average, so the average in the east-west direction, and you look at the seasonal ITCZ, to first order it more or less follows the insulation maximum, and um, especially if you average over land. Um, so over here you have the annual average ITCZ, averaged over all longitudes. Then you have the Northern Hemisphere Summer ITCZ, the summer hemisphere, uh, Southern Hemisphere Summer ITCZ in terms of precip. The, da the dashed lines are just over land, and then the solid lines are over all longitudes, ocean and land. It would be nice if there was one that was just ocean. That, I would like to see that, but I guess that wasn't in this paper. I could easily produce it, but I didn't. Anyway, it's just basically showing, so the annual mean over land, the ITCZ is on the equator which makes sense, um, and that's what we'd like to see, but when you average over all longitudes, including the ocean, the ITCZ on average is north of the equator. So that's somewhat interesting. Northern summer, over land and over the ocean, they're pretty much very similar, not exactly the same, but it's southern hemisphere summer that, okay, over the land, the ITCZ max is south of the equator. When you average over all longitudes, it's sort of, um, it's more south of the more the precip is happening south of the equator, but um, there's also still precipitation happening north of the equator. It's sort of double ITCZ uh, is what you see in this average. And I'd like to see. I guess I should have plotted it over the ocean. Um, presumably, yeah, over the ocean, you would get something that's off of the equator in the northern hemisphere. But um, I'd have to do it to know exactly what you would get. 
So the ITCZ behavior of the oceans is somewhat peculiar in this sense. The first order, like I said, it follows the insulation maximum over land. If you take a look at the annual average without taking the zonal mean, you can see that the annual average, the ITCZs, especially over the Pacific and the Atlantic, tend to be situated north of the equator. So that's that, when you take the zonal average, that's what you're getting, essentially, is those are what are dominating that signal. Now, when you look at Ju uh, July, August, and September, which is northern summer, the ITCZ, as expected, is north of the equator everywhere. There are some interesting features, like Indian Ocean, there's still an ITCZ, or precip max south of the equator, and over this, we call this the South Pacific Convergence Zone, there's still precip going on south of the equator there, so still not all north of the equator. And then during January, February, March, most of the convection is happening uh, south of the equator, but the Pacific, stubborn Pacific, it's north of the equator. So what is going on over the oceans? This is sort of just a bit an open question for uh, the ITCZ community. And so if you take a look at monthly precip in observations using GPCP, uh, 1979 to 2004 monthly precip, that is in the contour lines for all these plots. And CMIP5 uh, models, the model mean is shown in the shading. So um, we can kind of see the differences between the two. Um, let me backtrack. So essentially, over the ocean, the ITCZ has this peculiar behavior. So it'd be interesting to see, if you didn't know anything about this, how do the models do with this? Turns out they often struggle um, with this region, especially over the East Pacific. And what they do is they tend to produce a double ITCZ in January here. In the models, there are two preset maxes. Um, whereas in OBS, there's only one preset max, one northern ITCZ. Um, so I don't shake so much, I'm just gonna hold this. Uh, and then February, similar thing. You have this persistent southern hemisphere ITCZ. This is a part of what's called the double ITCZ problem. There's just a persistent convergence zone, or a persistent precip zone here south of the equator. And uh, I guess people call it the double ITCZ problem, but it's almost like the southern hemisphere ITCZ extension. So this region is the SPCZ. It's, it almost looks like this is extending from the SPCZ, um, and in reality, this does not occur. So what is going on here? We can say, okay, there are all these there are these biases that we see in climate models, but do we truly understand what's even going on in observations? And that's kind of what I'm trying to look at, um, is how can we understand what really goes on um, to prevent the ITCZ from being double all the time. So traditional ITCZ theory, to try to understand some of this behavior, has focused on the SSTs, sea surface temperatures, sea surface temperature gradients, because there are SST gradients in that region that are pretty strong uh, over the East Pacific, and low-level dynamics. Um, and now, more recently, some work has shown that the IDCZ has a sort of remote response, so it responds to extra tropical forcing. So if you warm one hemisphere, the ITCZ can shift to that hemisphere. Um, a lot of times this works pretty well on, the, on paleo scales, paleo climate scales, to try to understand what the ITCZ was like in different times uh, in, in past uh, other climates that aren't similar to the one we have currently. So this, some of these studies have shown some interesting results related to that. And it's sort of inspired framework uh, that helps us understand ITCZ location based on what is the hemisphere uh, energy transport. Because if you move the ITCZ from one hemisphere to the other, the Hadley circulation ends up transporting energy to the other hemisphere. So this cross equatorial uh, energy transport is a way that you can describe the ITCZ position. Uh, and so it starts with moist static energy. Um, if you're not familiar with moist static energy, it's essentially, it's, it has latent energy and enthalpy and then potential energy. And it works pretty well um, when you assume hydrostatic balance and, and pressure coordinates. And so it's a way to describe the basically moist energy uh, and thermodynamics of, of the system you're looking at, as well as potential energy, like I said. So for the ITCZ, if you look at the vertically integrated uh, mass uh, moist static energy equation, you have um, local tendency of MSE, and then you have the, uh, the, uh, the flux of MSE um, in the horizontal and vertical direction. And then on the right-hand side, you have energy input. 
in the form of just net short wave um, and outgoing long wave radiation. So that's negative just because it's out, outgoing. And then you have net ocean uptake of energy, which is also negative because it's taking energy away from the calm. So the relationship here between the ITCZ is when you have a strong ITCZ, this term right here is very strong in the meridional direction because you have cross equatorial energy transport. So studying this equation in a little more detail, first taking its zonal mean, you can understand some interesting things. You take the zonal mean and you also, once you take the zonal mean, you get rid of the, the zonal derivative of the divergence and you just get the meridional derivative. Um, there are some assumptions that go into this that are important and uh, deserve some other consideration, but I'm just going to continue because this is sort of what's been done. What I'm interested in evaporation. Uh, so that's essentially in your ocean uptake. Oh. It's accounted for in ocean up uptake. Yeah, it's just a simplification. Got you it. actually can call this, and it'll be the next one, net energy input. Got it. So you have net energy input into, uh, and then you have net energy input, and then you also have flux of uh, moist static energy in the meridional direction. And then you can come up with this variable, which has been, this has been a huge sort of breakthrough recently, is this energy flux equator. So this is the, um, the flux meridionally here, um, and it's basically just at Y1, which would just be your ITCZ location. So if you approximate that by doing a Taylor series, just a basic Taylor series, you get the cross energy flux of the equator, and then you get this term which devol involves the derivative, and you can just substitute this whole equation into here and make the assumption that we're sort of looking at steady state ITCZ behavior. So then you can get come up with this uh, equation that relates, you solve for Y1, and you can get essentially the ITCZ location is dependent on two things. So you're doing this just so that you can isolate what the dynamics of the ITCZ in one hemisphere. So you don't, need, you don't really need to know what's going on in the other hemisphere, you just integrate from the equator north. Yeah, so this is taking into consideration this cross equatorial energy uh, transport. And so what you end up getting is the ITCZ position to first order is dependent on cross equatorial uh, MSC transport flux divided by the net energy input both near the equator. So it has to do with these cross equatorial energy transport as well as how much energy is being input. Um, presumably, if you could think of an example El Nino situation, you have large net equatorial um, energy input. And so this term is pretty large. And so then the ITCZ is situated pretty close to the equator in, in the El Nino si situation. Whereas if you had um, really strong cross equatorial transport of energy, moist static energy, then the ITCZ will be located far away from the equator because the ITCZ is transporting energy um, from the Hadley circulation into the other hemisphere. So that sort of accounts for your two different situations off the equator ITCZ and near equatorial. So this is some, this is, these are advances that have been made to try to understand ITCZ position basically on seasonal or longer time scales. Um, and they work, it works pretty well actually. Um, and to try to understand this because I mentioned the double ITCZ problem, that's kind of what I'm going to go to. This actually does work pretty well if you're trying to understand seasonal or longer, longer changes and transitions actually from a single to a double ITCZ. Um, but the thing is you actually do have to make a slight adjustment and you actually, this Taylor series that we used earlier, you actually have to you actually have to have a little bit more detail here and approximate it using a third order scheme. Well, and also you've kind of just kicked the, kicked the, I don't know how to say it, like kicked the problem downstream. You have to know the cross equatorial energy transport in order to know where the ITCZ is this way. So, like, that's a, you know, that's yeah. a problem. If you don't know the answer to that, then you don't know where the ITCZ is in this case. So that would be the other issue with the energetic framework. Say, say again. The, um, the cross equatorial, you're saying? If well, you've you've essentially kicked the problem downstream or upstream or however you want to say, right? So if you want to know where the ITCZ is, you're saying here if you know the cross equatorial energy transport, then you know that. But then what determines the cross equatorial energy transport? Then is the next question, right? Yeah, yeah. And so also, it's, it's kind of a consistency statement more than a. Yeah, yeah, and the double ITCZ 
Um, it's kind of the cross equatorial transport is kind of pretty small. I think both terms are kind of small. In that, in this <coughs> right here, the cross equatorial energy input for double ITCC <coughs> would be somewhat small, wouldn't it? Because you have cross, you're basically going in both directions, two ITCCs transporting energy in opposite directions. So this this term will be kind of small. And that equatorial energy input will be kind of small. I was just trying to make a general statement because oh, oh, yeah. you were presenting this as an advance over. Uh, over you know other theories for where the ITCZ is, and I'm saying you know it's just saying that a different thing determines the ITCZ, and it doesn't say what determines that thing. I'm doing this mainly because yeah, this is I'm not going to focus on this so much, but uh, but yeah, this is like one way to look at it. And actually, it's it is interesting nonetheless. No, I agree. Uh, yeah. I agree. The yeah, energetic but it's frameworks like, it's are interesting. Simple, I'm just saying you. Well, I'm not. It's not so much simplified that I'm objecting to. Yeah. It's the idea that it's necessarily advanced rather than a parallel. Yeah. Um, so the idea was like once you have a double ITCC situation, um, these two terms are kind of small, so you can actually expand the Taylor series to include a few more terms, and you can actually end up getting this bifurcation going from a single to a double ITCZ um, in the seasonal cycle. And, and you can actually use this theory to, to show on seasonal or longer time scales a slow evolution from a single to a double. Um, and this approximation basically goes into the net, and, uh, net energy input near the equator. So, and there's a paper that showed that this framework actually not only works in a model, which this study, they used the model, aqua planet simulation, and it was not ocean coupled, it was just atmosphere um, model. And uh, a follow-up study basically showed that using error interim found that it could be useful to understand these seasonal double ITCZ shifts and also interannual shifts related to ENSO, so on longer time scales than seasonal. <clears throat> but more recently, Way and Bordoni found that the ITCZ energy balance framework is deficient on sub-seasonal time scales. So on these shorter time scales, Actually, the ITCZ, what happens is it lags EFE, energy flux equator. The energy flux equator, as a reminder, is this, essentially. This is the energy flux equator. <clears throat> Thinking about it as ITCZ position. It's where the energy flux goes to zero. That's where they're basically co-located. That's the assumption. So actually, ITCZ lags EFE, because EFE tends to follow insulation. So what happens is, during the transition season, when the ITCZ will want Basically, EFE will shift south of the equator, but the physical ITCZ in terms of its dynamics are still north of the equator and precip, so it lags. And so EFE and the ITCZ can actually be on opposite sides of the equator in that case. So it sort of doesn't warp that well when you're talking on these shorter time scales. And so it's no surprise, or uh, it's interesting, I'd say, in that the ITCZ, we know it can have this really dynamic variability on shorter time scales during the summer season, where the ITCZ tends to be really thin. Then it can break down into tropical depressions or tropical storms and give you tropical cyclones, and that's called the ITCZ breakdown. But we basically don't know what this is like during the spring. Nobody really had looked at it until recently. So recent work actually shows that the ITCZ does shift from hemisphere to hemisphere in the same season sometimes. Um, and it so exhibits this really interesting DLA to weekly variability. And so there's a pattern recognition algorithm that takes GridSat IR data, and it shows here, it basically determines every day the ITCZ state, whether it's a double ITCZ or in the blue, a north only ITCZ, a south only ITCZ, an absent ITCZ, or an equatorial ITCZ. And so this is going back to 1979 to 2012 using GRIDSAT grid IR data. And so every day it assigns a state. And during the summertime in here, it's almost all white. But there's some variability. So the, the ITCZ is mostly north of the equator or the East Pacific. But during this season, it's all over the place. Um, but you can still see interannual variability. For example, equatorial ITCZ states happen during El Nino years. They show up during the really two strong El Ninos and some weaker El Nino events. Um, and so these five ITCZ states can basically happen um, during, especially March and April. They, they can happen um, anytime. And they can change day to day. 
they go through this really dynamic daily to weekly variability. And so this is just um, a different way to look at the last diagram. Actually, probably makes more sense to me. Um, it's just the number of counts of each of these states for each month. So it gets rid of, this is just for all the years. So clearly, March through April, and even a little bit of February, you can basically get any IT season state. And so overall, the northern only ITCZ occurs 39% of the time. The double occurs 34% uh, of the time. And those are basically the two dominant states. And then you do have a south ITCZ that occurs 8% 8, 8 of the time. Then absent ITCZ, where it's just weak, um, doesn't really, it occurs 12% of the time. And then the equatorial ITCZ, which I'm kind of going to drop from here on out because it's really tied to interannual variability. But that occurs about 7% of the time, but it's very interannual, so certain years, I mean, it's happening almost, you know, more than 50% of the time. So what are the underlying dynamics for these different ITCZ states? That's sort of what I'm trying to explore, um, and trying to explore it by not only looking at these the observations we have to understand what's going on in the observations, but try to see if, you know, once we understand a little bit more about the observations, see if anything can be done to try to guide the climate modeling community to see if we can improve parameterizations to understand why the models are producing this double ITCZ um, most of the time when in fact it's actually happening less than the north ITCZ. Actually if you take a look back at the original like CMIP 5 simulations, the southern ITCZ state, I'd bet you that that's probably occurring way too much too. Um, oh, I can actually I'm yeah. skip right back because it's a good reminder that they call it the double ITCZ problem, but February, the northern ITCZ in the shading here is very weak. It's actually, if that algorithm looked at that, I bet you it would call it a south ITCZ. And it would be interesting to do this, to use this algorithm and models, and that's part of the plan of, of this project. But I'm not showing that today. So in the, uh, the model imaging, not the model, sorry, the uh, algorithm imaging data, it was only looking at these specific ITCZ, right? Yeah. So that's, a lot more usually in the north, I think, than in the south, whereas in the west Pacific, it, you have a south Pacific conversion zone. Yeah. So yeah. There would be a different distribution over the whole planet versus just over the east Pacific. It would be a lot more. Yeah. So yeah. And we have, there is, a, they, they have found a relationship between the SPCZ yeah. and the east Pacific. Basically, when the SPCZ in observations is strong, the ITCZ, the east Pacific, is actually very weak or absent. It falls okay. into the absent state. Um, the statistics that you were referring to, do those refer to the whole Pacific, the no, global, just the or East just the East Pacific? Just okay. the East Pacific, yeah. 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 Presumably yeah. the algorithm could be used anywhere, but um, okay. for now it's just been using the East Pac. Um, and so I just wanted to show an example because I look at these all the time. And this past year we had a really interesting double ITCZ like, behavior. I found one of the best double ITCZs ever in my opinion, <laughs> and I was really happy. So March 8th, this past year, I don't know what the algorithm would call this. I probably should know, but again, this is not my algorithm, but it would be interesting to see uh, what the algorithm would do with this, because it's we only have it till 2012 currently, but I think that the person who created it, they're now, they've moved on, they've generalized it so we can use it at any time we want. So I'm not sure if this would be a southern or a double, but this will transition next day. Sorry it moves, we moved a little bit further east here in South America. So there's still that really strong southern one, or I wouldn't say really strong, but nice ITCZ, and the northern one starts to extend a little bit, and then we've shifted a little further west, but you have these two really nice double ITCZs and actually kind of weird behavior um, that they sort of shift in latitude. I don't even know how common that is, but it's pretty amazing uh, to see that. Right, so it's curious, so this is the satellite imagery. If you were to look at reanalysis data, would you see significant evidence of significant convergence in two bands in those regions? I'm going to show that a little bit. Okay. Um, yes, the paper does uh, address that. And essentially, there are basically always two convergence zones. But there is some slight differences. Uh, there are slight differences. But I'm going to go over that in a, a little bit here. It, um, but that's like the next thing. So then uh, the next day, this, uh, the northern convergence zone <coughs> intensifies and the southern convergence zone is sort of there. And then the southern convergence zone starts to actually break up quite a bit. And then eventually the southern convergence zone, or I'm saying convergence zone, but we're talking about cloud structure. 
um, the northern one sort of becomes more dominant. And, um, and then, then after that, it starts to sort of break up into these mesoscale systems. So essentially, there still is some, I'd say, interesting weather going on here. And um, it's not just in nature that the ITC is stagnant, it's just in this one state. And so this is interesting, but what is SST, how is SST playing a role in here? And I actually believe that even at the daily to weekly time scale, SSTs obviously can play a role. Um, but it's highlighted here in the study that so the SITCZ, the southern one, and the equatorial one are the ones that are associated with the strongest ocean variability. And so this is the equatorial ITCZ SST anomalies from uh, 1982 to 2012. Um, and so this is associated with that El Nino sort of like conditions. And then the southern ITCZ is more associated with La Nina like conditions. Um, and so those uh, the other states, I mean, they still have an SST signal. I think we need to delve into the details a little bit more on those states. You know, doing a composite analysis like this may not be as good as maybe looking at certain case scenarios to try to understand individual events, um, try a different approach. But to first order, those states are actually not necessarily too different when it comes to the SSTs. Those but are significant differences for the tropics, the northern SST and southern SST cases. like. Oh, yeah, between the northern and the southern, yeah. Oh, which ones are oh, you I'm talking, talking about? about the, the, FMDD, the northern and the double. They're oh, actually okay. kind of opposite. Um, I actually wish the magnitude were a little bit. The northern one has warmer SSTs in the northern hemisphere by about half a degree. Yeah, and, and cooler in the southern. Yeah. So, so that's why I'm saying it's not non insignificant. I think in the study they maybe said, oh, it's insignificant, or I don't know. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would argue that's not insignificant. So, but yes, maybe these small differences are. Uh, are pretty interesting. I think I think they are worth looking at more, um, but they're not as strong as the E and the S ITCC states. If you take a look at um, the GridSat IR, oh, I guess it does get cut off. This is GridSat IR for the um, four states. I'm not looking at equatorial ITCC because I ended up looking at QuickSat QuickScat data, which is just 10 years long, and the equatorial ITCC occurred just three days, so it's really kind of messy. Um, anyway. So this is surface convergence, or surface divergence, so blue is convergence, red colors are divergence, and then this is basically your IR data for the states, which is what the algorithm is going off of. So the algorithm is going off of, okay, there's a really clear, deep, convective band in the room ITCZ. In surface convergence, also, there is strong surface convergence in the northern ITCZ, but there's also still convergence south of the equator. Um, and basically, if you look at all these, it'd be hard to say for sure that these are, and I, I should do, I'm probably gonna do a significance test, but there's convergence going on south of the equator for all of these states and north of the equator. So when you look at the dynamics, it's not necessarily that clear that there's a huge difference um, between them, at least at first view. I also showed vorticity, although vorticity, I guess it just basically shows that they're really similar. Um, all these different cases. The vorticity may be stronger in this SITCZ case. Um, blue being that it's cyclonic south in the southern hemisphere. The positive means it's cyclonic north of the in the northern hemisphere. So you get these two basically high vorticity regions, large surface convergence. But the, uh, the take home message there is that they're not that different. Now if you do a zonal average to try to understand uh, specifically over this region right here, um, which is basically the East Pac. Um, I mean, it depends on how far you want to go west, but if you just look further east um, and try to look at the differences between zonal wind, radial wind, vorticity, and divergence, you see that there are differences, but there aren't, there aren't differences first north of the equator. I mean, they're basically all the same. Most of the differences are occurring really close to the equator, and maybe a little bit down here south of the equator, but definitely north of the equator, or in the northern hemisphere, there's really not that big differences in these fields. And essentially, there's convergence going on in the southern hemisphere, even during the northern ITCZ state, just like I showed before. So the differences aren't really that large. This sort of surface convergence, DITCZ, is always present. But when you talk about clouds and precipitation, it's, I didn't show precip, but it's very similar to the IR data. I mean, it's very different, the precip in the southern and northern convergence zones. 
Um, so that's really interesting. And um, one way I thought about breaking this up, because the DITCZ and NITCZ are the sort of two most common states. Those are the ones that I'm really interested in. Um, to first order, try to understand what distinguishes this North only and this double, only ITCZ. Um, it's just very small differences. I mean, this cross equatorial radiana wind is probably the, the biggest difference. Um, and the, uh, one way you can see that is if you break this radiana wind, and you can do it for zonal wind too, into symmetric and anti symmetric components. The big differences are basically in the symmetric component of meridiana wind, which is just cross-equatorial uh, meridiana winds. So that is basically what you would get in a single ITCZ case. Strong meridiana winds crossing the equator. So you get an off-equatorial ITCZ. But the anti-symmetric part, part, which gives you actually a double ITCZ, um, if you look over here, they're very similar. So it's almost like the double ITCZ is always there, but there's something about the northern ITCZ state that gives you stronger cross-equatorial uh, transport. Are you going to say something? Um, well, uh, yeah, no, I, I have more. I was writing down stuff to say later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's, it's, and this is some of this is really preliminary, but it's definitely. I mean, it's not too surprising. I mean, the northern ITCZ state. I was expecting there to be more cross-equatorial transport. I thought that maybe there would be some differences in the anti-symmetric part. Of course, when you do this sort of thing. Um, you're sort of, it's not necessarily always the thing that you should lead, lead your hat on. I mean, you gotta, you gotta look at more detail. So I'm using, I'm gonna use a model to sort of look at yeah. this in a little more detail. I mean, I guess I would argue that those IT, those, that northern hemisphere being warmer and southern hemisphere being colder is the thing. It might be small differences that make that's, a huge difference. They, and that's make a big of, difference to Cape. A degree of SST could make a pretty significant difference to and your Cape it appears from example. the simulations I'm going to show that in near the equator you don't really need super strong gradients to really produce right. a small strong temperature gradients wind. gradients can make a big small temperature gradients can make a big difference. It's not a linear thing, yeah. So, um, and that's what I'm going to show next. Um, and so, to try to understand this, I'm going to use this model that I used for my PhD, but I. I had sort of, had, it had a different, I was using these idealized profiles, which were really interesting and came out with some really interesting results. But here I'm actually going to sort of generalize the model. Um, and the model basically showed that nonlinear transient boundary layer dynamics can help in determining ITCZ position with an intensity. And it basically has to, has to do with meridional infections of the meridional winds that dominate the momentum of the budget. And, uh, and I'm going to show what that actually means in the next slide, or two slides. So it's a generalization of this uh, paper that I had in 2016. And, um, and we focus on the East Pacific specifically. And we look at boreal summer, and we look at the spring, ITCZs. So instead of forcing the model with some idealized profiles, we use Yahtzee reanalysis, which is a reanalysis reanalysis product that was just for two years, but it was quarter degree resolution. and um, it's really nice because it captured El Nino-like conditions and La Nina-like conditions. It just happened to work out that way for the two years. So it's really nice for the spring ITCZ because you get in observations one year where you had more double-like, double ITCZ conditions, and one where you had more single ITCZ conditions. So I like to say it's almost like the simplest ITCZ model, but maybe that's not the case. It's somewhat simple, still complicated, and it retains a lot of nonlinearities. Um, and so the nice thing about it is I can run it in just a few minutes. I can run it in a few minutes at one kilometer or run it in a few seconds at one degree. Um, but it's 1D in latitude. It's only symmetric. It's very simple, even though it's going to look complicated right now. Um, so sorry to scare you with equations, but this is the model. And essentially what it is, if you, get, if you just sort of ignore a lot of these terms right over here. Well, no, let's not do that. Uh, let's just start off from the beginning. So you have zonal momentum and you have meridional infection of zonal momentum. This is your Coriolis term. This is sphere, spherical coordinates. Surface drag, these are essentially, um, we call them Ekman suction terms, but basically this is communication between what's going on in the free troposphere and the boundary layer from a dynamical perspective. And then horizontal diffusion basically helps the model not blowing up on us. Um, 
And then meridional equation, so that's DVDT, got cut off. And then you have the meridional advection, Coriolis, surface drag. And then the difference here, this is pressure gradient. This is what's going to drive, and this is a big assumption, but we're going to drive the whole thing by giving it observed pressure gradient fields for different months and see what it can produce, double ITCZ, single ITCZ. Pretty simple in that respect. And then these terms are analogous to the first equation. And then continuity, continuity equation is the last equation you need here. And it's really simple because it's only symmetric. Um, and so this is your, the forcing term, like I said, this is what drives the whole problem, uh, or drives the solutions. And then this term right here is the nonlinear term. And it's actually, it's a term that's used in mathematics to show how you get discontinuities. Um, and here's the example. You start off, this, imagine this is the equator, this is 10 north. You have meridional winds that are opposing each other, like in the ITCZ. And you have surface, con you have low level convergence over a pretty broad region from peak to peak. And then what happens over time, if you just had these two terms and you did have some diffusion, it's actually like molecular diffu diffusion, you basically, that gradient sharpens up on itself until you get a discontinuity. So this term, it's always in the equation, it's always there, but it plays an important role when V is large enough, when these meridional winds on the other side are large enough. So for the East Pacific, the meridional winds are really large, this cross equatorial wind. So presumably this could play an important role. Um, I just have a quick question about the formulation. There's the W, is that determined from the convergence? W over H, the Ekman, what you call the Ekman suction? It's, it's just the subsidence regions. Um, we'll have to go over maybe okay. the derivation in detail, but um, it's basically yeah, the subsidence is the... But that's determined, that's, that's not a constant. That W is not a constant, that's part of your solution? It's part of the solution, yeah. Okay. The, um, I guess I, so, so the other thing is I have, I prescribe these, VOL and ULL, that's the free tropospheric winds, so those are prescribed as well, which do play a role. Um, sure, and they're but, important. but the W is part of the solution. The yeah, w, 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 w over H, okay. Is still being uh, determined by the model and is evolving, but it's it's not prognostic, I guess, but. <clears throat> it, uh, it's not prognostic. Right, it's just diagnostic, okay. but it's still. Yeah, yeah. But it's evolving. Yeah, yeah. But it's evolving okay. like with everything else. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Boundary conditions, I basically force everything to go to zero here, the subtropical highs, <clears throat> far enough away from the equator. And then uh, the initial conditions are starting, basically I started some sort of state of balance. So for this, I start off with what's called Ekman balance. And so that's just essentially a, a force balance uh, between pressure gradient surface drag, because we're in the boundary layer, you can't get rid of the surface drag, um, and then Coriolis. So it's first order, that's a nice approximation to not let your model go crazy in the beginning. <clears throat> and then the forcing I use here is from the Yahtzee reanalysis, like I said, and just over the East Pacific, I, I average the pressure gradient over the East Pacific. It actually seems like a lot of assumptions, but it's still really, it's interesting. A boundary layer only, pressure gradient, average and then I do a monthly average too. So it's sort of, it's actually kind of like you smooth out things, but you can still get these really sharp convergence zones, even if you smooth out the thermodynamic fields. Um, and then, yeah, the Ekman balance is what it starts off. I'm gonna show an animation here. Oh, no, not yet. Okay, so these are the three months, July 2008, to March 2009, March 2010. Um, and this is trim precip averaged over the East Pacific. So the model ITCZ in terms of its convergence is located here in the dashed lines. So the ITCZ in the model is able to pinpoint, especially March 2009, you had times where it was double. You have these two con uh, precip regions and then you had times where it was just single, south of the equator. Um, and so the ITCZ in the model actually does have double ITCZ uh, convergence, but this one is significantly stronger. Um, so that's interesting because some of the precip rates here, especially here in that time, the stronger south of the equator and then March 2010, which is that El Nino-like year, gives you a strong near equatorial ITC. And these are the forcings that we're dealing with. I showed July 2008, although I'm going to be focusing on 2009 and 2010. And so if you just look at these years, this was like essentially your double ITCZ, southern ITCZ. This was your single near equatorial ITCZ, 
the initial condition and these pressure gradients are very similar. The differences are really right here close to the equator. Um, and you can look at this in a lot of detail. And I think it's important to do that. Um, but I feel like I'm running a little on time, so I gotta get it going. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, here's the animation of the March 2009 ITCZ. This, I'm gonna let it play one more time. This is zonal wind, meridional wind, vorticity, and vertical velocity at the top of the boundary layer. For two resolutions of the model, one kilometer basically, and quarter degree. So both pretty high, but one is super high. And the ITCZ ends up, so you have two convergence regions for both simulations, and then the really high resolution simulation really prefers the southern one. And the vertical velocities get up to um, five centimeters per second, which sounds like nothing, but I mean, that's pretty significant for this long region. And if you're thinking about this, this is covering, it's like 65 degrees of longitude. So um, it's really interesting how the model sort of pinpoints the southern ITCZ, and it really it kind of tries to give you another really sharp uh, gradient here, north of the equator, but it doesn't actually work out. And the subsidence region here gets pretty strong over time. Um, so as this is developing, you envision a Hadley circulation transporting uh, momentum and energy south of the equator, so you have this strong subsidence region that's also developing at the same time. Um, and that's pretty instantaneous. Um, time. So, and this happens over the period of just a few days. I'm just going to go to the steady state solutions. So, I guess I'll just focus mainly on the, the vertical velocity. So, now I've overlaid not only those two simulations, but Yahtzee and then also the initial condition. So, the initial condition, which is equum balance, actually does produce those two ITCZs. And then the low resolution run does do the two ITCZs, but they're so weak. And Yahtzee also sort of has this. Um, but it's this really high resolution run that gets you the really strong vertical velocity at the top of the boundary layer. So if you look at the momentum budget, and uh, again, I'm gonna let this play um, again, but that black line is the effective turn. It gets really large, and uh, diffusion actually like, it fights it, because what happens is, it's actually trying to go sub-grid scale, pull up one kilometer resolution. It's trying, to, it's trying to create this discontinuity that I was showing before, but it's actually not going to happen according to the, the diffusion. Um, but it really wants to create this intense vertical velocity. Um, and presumably, if I didn't have to use diffusion, I mean, that vertical velocity, I mean, it would go as high as it could go, essentially. I was curious, in the prior slide, you have these sharp vorticity peaks. Yeah. Do, does the diffusion prevent any sort of instability from occurring? Yeah, yeah. It's sufficient to do it. Mm -hmm. So the high resolution doesn't really match observations then, right? Since if you coarsened the high resolution case, you wouldn't get back the coarse resolution case. Is that right? Wait, say that again? The high resolution case doesn't really match observations, right? Based on what you showed. Is that accurate? I was trying to show that the, the observations, the preset mainly occurred south of the equator. But the observations are of convergence, of boundary layer convergence. Yeah, so I'm going to readdress that because, yeah, it seems counterintuitive, right? And so your coarse resolution is giving convergence in both hemispheres, yeah. whereas your fine resolution is not giving the same convergence in both hemispheres. Yes. So that means that your finer resolution case is not matching the observations. Well, I still think that the observations, you're averaging over so many cases. I think we need to look, I, I would need to look case by case to not smooth out the possibly large vertical velocities. If they're occurring at slightly different latitudes when you average, it becomes more of a smooth um, convergence zone. <clears throat> so okay. I think it's still valid because there's still two convergence zones going on in the high resolution model. It's just showing. But if you averaged a bunch of those high resolution cases at slightly different latitudes, you still wouldn't get back a double ITCZ, right? I mean, it, I, I guess it depends. I mean, you can kind of picture that, right? If I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it seems like there could be some counterintuitive things going on here. 
but it's hard to compare apples to apples if I'm comparing this one run to you know, like all these cases. So this is like. Well, I guess haven't you composited the convergence by ITCZ type? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of an average over time because these events, you know, may have this transient variability that. Um, so you wouldn't compare that to your model result. You don't think it makes sense to compare that to your model result? No, I do, I do, I do. I, I'm, I'm saying that it's, they still produce these two convergence zones. It's just showing which one is more preferential. Um, but the observations don't have that. They kind of do, but yeah, it was like Well, they really don't small. have it in terms of convergence. Yeah, it was really small. I mean, there were some differences, but I was saying that. The, sur the surface convergence in the ops, quick scat, there are always two double ITCZs, and it's really small, the differences. Okay, yeah. whereas the high resolution cases are big differences yeah. here. I mean, it's yeah. possible also that quick scat may not be getting enough detail. I don't know. Um, this is sort of, yeah, preliminary. I'm just thinking, like, even if you coarsen your high resolution cases, you don't get back the low resolution, right? Because of the yeah, well, yeah, well, it's non linear terms, basically. Yeah. Because of you the non linear get terms. Back. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so the coarse resolution or the fine resolution really doesn't match the observations because of that, right? But I keep going. Yeah. So then this is the low resolution. Oh, that's the steady state budget. Um, uh, the animation, so this, uh, the effective term really has, <clears throat> gets really large near the convergence zone south of the equator. Um, and the one north of the equator, which also had a convergence zone, it doesn't really get nearly as large. So that just goes to show you the role of this nonlinear effective term in really forcing this uh, low level convergence in one ITCZ versus having it be both or the wrong ITCC, I guess. And then if you go to a low resolution run, which isn't really about that low resolution, you actually, the black line, whoops, the black line gets a lot smaller. Okay, sorry my file's like half a gig, so it's probably what's going on. It's, but, but the effective terms are, are still there, I mean they're not non-zero, but they're definitely weaker. And so what happens is, Diffusion kicks up, and it's pretty large. Um, before, in this last case, diffusion was large, but it was basically really close to the convergence region. Whereas here, the model is constantly trying to prevent it from going subgrid scale. It can't really resolve that detail. So, and um, so, if you just take a look at mm, the multitude of, I, I could use more resolution or different resolutions, but if you just take a look at a few resolutions, as you go to higher resolution, you're able to resolve this. So is the answer that we just need to increase the resolution of our models? No, that's not the answer. But if you are able to get the thermodynamic state right, and you have this pressure gradient which you're very confident in, I have confidence that if you increase the resolution of the model, um, even a simplified model, you would get um, these sort of sharp gradients and intense vertical motion without a, a convective parameterization. Um, and then, I'm running low on time, so I'm not going to show. The March 2010 animation is cool, too. Um, but it shows the single ITCZ case. Um, and it shows that a lot of these same terms are playing a role, um, just like the first case. And uh, also, resolution matters here, but you're still just always producing one ITCZ. So I'd say in this case, you would presume that a climate model may have an easier time predicting this one ITCZ case. Because even if you go to one degree resolution, you're basically getting this region of convergence. You don't need to get two ITCZs. That two ITCZ case is a lot more difficult um, because you need two separate convergence regions. Um, whereas in this case, you have pretty much just broad convergence going on everywhere here. Um, and yeah, yeah, in a transient situation, you're in a burst of convection. Um, so that's not necessarily as difficult as this double ITCZ case. Okay, so ITCZ strength position with and coupling between moisture and dynamics is a co complex multi-scale problem and I've sort of just looked at the dynamical parts of it, um, but the part of the study that I'm showing is just one part of it. And so I want to look at this in more detail um, in OBS and using theory to try to understand better these different double versus single ITCZ states. And so the ITCZ behavior of the ocean 
I said, is really different than it is over land. And it's, it really is difficult. It's not surprising that the climate models struggle with this because it's, we still don't understand all the details, especially over the East Pacific. And so these recent advances in energy balance theory do apply to the ITCZ and the double ITCZ on longer time scales, um, but they do have issues on these sub-seasonal time scales. And maybe this could be contributing to these GCM issues is the sub-seasonal variability that's, um, but this is still unknown. A lot of this, a lot of these methods, this pattern recognition algorithm, this can all be applied to GCMs to try to understand, you know, in more detail what's going on. Presumably to start off with one model, to not just go crazy with it, you know, just detailed analysis on one model, see what we get. And so this idea of the energy flux equator with this energy balance theory in the NTCZ can lie on opposite sides of the equator. That's a really interesting result. And I think that more work needs to be done to understand um, the details of that. And so this sub-seasonal variability of the East Pacific um, is significant. Um, and we need to understand these, the different dynamics and thermodynamic uh, sort of environments that these states are um, forming in. And so I looked at this in a little more detail using a theoretical model to try to understand some of the terms that are at play in the dynamics. And so we, I used March 2009 and March 2010 Gatsby pressure gradient fields. And so overall they did a pretty good job, um, even though it's a really simple model, but it was able to show these detailed structures and really intense vertical motion and vorticity that are associated presumably with individual ITCZ events. And so the force balance is dependent on horizontal resolution, but resolution isn't the only thing um, and it may not be just a simple fix by increasing resolution. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that we, that is, once you have a lot of these conditions and you have the right sort of forcing, this simple model can really shed some light into some of the important dynamics that are going on that are not linear, they're not linear. Um, so hopefully we can understand this using observations, reanalyses, and a hierarchy of models. Right, they just kick it up <laughs> to yeah, yeah, yeah. avoid this. But you, I, so that W equation is that just determined as a diagnostic from a from a continuity or the W is that from a continuity equation? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's just down to continuity. Okay, and so there's no like back pressure like you get with the lens and the thing type model to that spreads that, that um, area conversions out at all. It's acting yeah. like a well, back it's. I mean, it's there is a ventilation term, but that it's in there. Yeah. yeah, it's in there. But I would say that I haven't focused on that as much. And that's definitely something that I think Larissa, Larissa and I talked about um, and something that needs to be understood better. I sort of focused on the nonlinear term because we use this model, they use this sort of model in the tropical cycling community. And um, so they've used this to show eye wall, basically gradient sharpening. Now you can get really rapid intensification. You start off with just like, a tropical storm or depression vortex, and then you just give it some time, and it'll, it will produce strong radial inflow, and then it'll produce an eye wall within six to 12 hours, you know, which is realistic based on rapid intensification. So, yeah, I mean, this sort of model framework is not really used so much in this context, but I think 
yeah, the, the focus was to see, okay, is this nonlinear, this particular term, is that playing a role? Is it dominant um, near the convergence region? But yeah, there's still some details that need to be ironed out. What happens to that convergence? Um, yeah, yeah, in it's terms of it's yeah, communication it's with the free troposphere and yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard to really kind of figure out though whether or not, I mean, given a, you know, if you look at like a hydraulic jump or something, and a, you know, that's the term that gives you your hydraulic jump. Yeah. And so putting that in, you're, you expect discontinuities to develop. But as the question is, why don't those discontinuities to an extreme uh, extent, why don't they uh, happen in say, a longer time scale? And there's some other adjustments of the, of the system that, that yeah. spreads that effect out. And I wonder whether or not... Uh, well, at some point, convection has to occur. Yeah. Once you get enough yeah. vertical motion, I mean, it's that strong, yeah. but it's also. E either sorry, way, yeah, either way, I think you know this is something I hadn't really thought of in terms of the, the relevance of that term in the Eastern Pacific, and I think it's worth. Uh, you know, I think this shows that that could be an important term. It'd be really interesting to see, you know, an analysis of some of the high resolution. I think the CMWF is coming out with a high resolution new era five mm -hmm. uh, to, to determine, you know, how important is that term in, in that part of the old contemporary yeah. analyses. So uh, one other thing to add on to that is this is actually, so we were uh, wondering, can this even happen in the ITCC? The meridional flow isn't that strong. You know, in hurricanes, the meridional flow is an order of magnitude larger. We're talking about 20 meter per second radio winds with uh, these really intense tropical cyclones. So this is like, you know, in the East Pacific, that's where you get some strong meridional winds, but on the order of five to 10 meters per second. So, I mean, they're still, they're weaker. So we weren't sure if it was gonna happen. And that may describe the different shapes of the ITCZ as you change in longitude. It may partially be dependent on how strong is this meridional flow because there is a threshold. Um, we have a really simplified version of, the, of these, this model to basically show these different regimes. If the meridional flow isn't large enough, if that initial convergence region, um, but basically the pressure gradient isn't strong enough, it's not going to do this. It's gonna be more of a smoothed out convergence region and it's not going to be really tightly confined like you see in the specific. So this could possibly be um, ex explanatory. It could help explain the different shapes of the ITCZ um, in different regions of the globe. And it's really it's at the threshold of where this becomes an important term. Um, and another thing I didn't mention, just last thing, is that Coriolis term essentially. Once you get far enough away from the equator, Coriolis plays an effect. Has an effect. And this effective term, because F is small near the equator, really only works near the equator. And so that can partially explain why the ITCZ needs to be close to the equator. It's where these effective terms can help sharpen up the gradients and give you a long convergence region. So, I mean, it's very theoretical. <laughs> but there's, there's that interesting balance between that kind of stiffly effective forces. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh. Uh, now I forget what I was going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, I was going to point out that there are two major differences be, between what you're doing and what other people like me have done, and one of that is what you're doing with the W over H term, mm -hmm. the Ekman suction that you're referring to. Yeah. Like the interpretation and in other work of that term is that it's um, uh, cumulus overshooting the top of the boundary layer, mm -hmm. or the most recent other work, there's Lunds and Negum stuff, but then the way we interpreted some of that term was cumulus overshooting the top of the boundary layer and sucking down air, shallow cumulus sucking down air um, from above the boundary layer, and that would not necessarily be related to the vertical velocity. Um, so that's a difference that might matter for your results. But I think it's really interesting how much of a difference the resolution makes, and this idea that the nonlinear terms could have a big impact, and I think there's probably, I think there's probably some relevance to what's really happening in the real world, and I'm really interested in exploring that further. So, but I think I just just kind details. of second, second um, Dan's comment that you, the, you know, there's there's still some stuff that needs some working out in terms of which terms are really relevant to yeah. the real world, convincing. Yeah. And using a high resolution reanalysis might be might be a way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk in more detail because there is uh, yeah, there's more to be ironed out. 
this is, this, I don't know if this isn't too tangential, but I remember in a summer school, not too long ago, we were talking about the double ITCC problem, and um, someone at Washington kind of mentioned how someone did a study with the topography of Panama, and how somehow getting that little bit of topography right had a big impact on the double ITCC, and like I can't remember anything more than that or why, but I'm just wondering if you or anyone else can like comment on that or have any idea what I'm talking about. That was the other comment I was going to make is that the way that cross equatorial energy fluxes and things like topography, yeah. part of them changing where the ITCZ is is by changing the SSTs a little bit. Yeah. And so everything that the SST is sensitive to, so that could be those winds related yeah. to, for example, like there's small channels, yeah. Yeah. things like that, that, right? That can change the SST. The and that speed, SST yeah. influences the pressure gradients, yeah. which you can see these yeah. Yeah. very small pressure gradient differences can have a big impact. Yeah, sort of, yeah. People talk about the land configuration, the fact that there's more land in the hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of all tied back to, yeah, SST and pressure gradient distribution. Because if you took a look at each region, if you define them by different ITCs and regions, the the continents are so different. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, and actually the East Pacific ITCZ, I mean, kind of has a little bit more in common with the Atlantic, but I mean, that's the closest next thing, but they're all kind of unique in that sense. Um, and then in the Indian Ocean ITCZ, I didn't show it, there's actually one south of the equator that's really persistent. And of course, there's like this huge landmass north of the equator. So, I mean, I feel like they are related, but it's kind of hand wavy, I guess, at this point. Yeah. All right, well, let's thank our speaker.